uh, we will have, let me see, around um, 25 minutes, good 25 minutes for discussion. Please use, uh, most of you will know that, use, use this uh, Q and A button at the, at, at the Zoom uh, framework to put your questions in and then uh, I will choose the, some of the questions. Let's see how much time we have. Um, and then we go into the discussion and until people now are joining in, I start with my question to Ian. <laughs> so first, Ian, I, I want to say I really enjoyed your talk. This is important to think about political strategies. Uh, this is also a crisis and this Corona crisis uh, there's really something at stake and to, you, to, to think it, about it in a political way and what political strategies we should take up and what principles to reorganize our society and the way we live together is really important. And your talk is exactly going through what kind of strategies, political strategies exist right now and what would be good political strategy, what, what do you think would be really important and good strategies. And uh, I agree actually with your, uh, uh, also I think it's important that you are uh, uh, suggesting four concrete demands, political demands, uh, and I agree with them. So, um, and they are, however, my question, um, this, and in a way you also have it in your talk, but I want to talk a bit more about it. This Corona crisis is just part of a bigger crisis. I would say we are in a, a climate crisis, climate crash cli uh, crisis. The whole planet is in danger, life on this planet. So uh, how, and then if I see on your four demands, they are good, but don't we need more? So more demands, which, which um, are rooted also in, in the analysis you have. So, uh, uh, exploitation of the planet, uh, strange forms of globalizations. So I, I was thinking maybe we have to, I agree with your political strategies, but maybe we need more. And Mike, so connected to a broader framework of crisis. So my question is, would you agree? And then do you have any ideas how, how we could, of more political principles we need? Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. Uh, we need many, many more demands to address the different facets of the ecological crisis that we're facing here. And I, I think it's, it's right, you're right to draw attention to the fact that this coronavirus crisis doesn't simply come out of nowhere as an accident of biology, um, but is a function of particular forms of production and despoilation of the environment that are happening under the capitalism. Um, and so, you know, one simple big demand that we could make would be to overthrow capitalism and replace it with uh, collectivized uh, kind of economic production um, and in which we all share in that and take decisions that are humane to each other and caring of the planet. Okay, that would be one big demand. Um, but uh, that really is not very realizable um, at immediately. And so I think we need to pose demands that open up a space for all of the other things that you would wish to, to bring in. Um, there are you know, questions of sexual exploitation, there are questions of racism, there are as well as uh, 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 class relations at stake here. And so I just focused on four demands as a way of opening up the field. We need to find a way of keying into people's concerns at the moment as they directly experience them. So that the demands that we pose are demands that appear sensible and humane and um, realizable. But I think what we discover as we try and um, try and argue for those demands, I think what we'll discover is that this wretched political economic system that we live in at the moment, global capitalism, cannot meet those demands. Uh, and that, that they're in, a, in the old, old political vocabulary, they would be called transitional demands. That's, that's why I posed 
simply for to open up the way for many other things to appear and to be debated and to be argued for. Yeah. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, uh, this shouldn't be a dialogue only with uh, Ian and myself. So put your questions into this uh, Q and A section. Write them down. Uh, it's, uh, we are very curious to hear your thoughts and comments, questions. Um, don't hesitate to write that down. Okay, now they are dropping in. Uh, Andrea, Andrea Bernal, and Ian, I just, I'm just reading the question. Is social entrepreneurship a viable way to build viral resistance? Mohamed Yunus has said, we need to stop thinking of governments as exclusive problem solvers. Citizens can do much more than take care of the families and pay their taxes. Businesses with a purpose are now thriving. Do you agree with these positions? Well, I think it, it really depends what you mean by entrepreneur. Uh, if by entrepreneur you mean an individual taking uh, active uh, steps in order to, um, to to offer something to the marketplace, then I think um, I think that's actually part of the problem that we're faced with at the moment. That people are, are driven by profit um, and many entrepreneurs are driven by profit as well and is that profit motive which is at the root of the problem that we have in the destruction of the environment but if by social entrepreneur you mean collectives small collectives of people working together in order to discover how they can coexist and build communities that are more respectful of each other and more democratic then i think you're onto something there uh, so i i would want to ask in what sense you mean social entrepreneur. Uh, I wouldn't go down the road, for example, of the microcredit initiatives, which encourage people to be their own little capitalists and to get themselves into debt and to become of the very economic system that we need to challenge. Uh, I would rather look to a, a different model of collective activity, which, which is very different from the way that entrepreneur is usually understood. Okay, thank you, uh, Ian. Um, questions are dropping in. Oh, um, there's one from Barbara. Um, and and um, in a way I could collect it with some more questions. One, question, one range of questions uh, are about how to realize this demands, this political demands. So how to put them into reality or how to work with them. And Baba is asking, you mentioned demands, but to whom we should direct our demands if the states, if the states are not valuable intellectuals? Good question. Now, this is a very good point. Um, and I, I think that actually we have no choice in some circumstances, but to make demands on the state. Um, Although I'm, I'm an old Marxist, um, I, I think that we have to recognize that states, capitalist states, are very contradictory creatures. Uh, that capitalist states include many social actors who are involved in the state at different levels, wanting to bring about change and um, enduring the frustrations and the obstacles uh, that and we need to be able to those people so that they can use the resources that they have to help us so the kind of demands that we should be placing upon the state are the kind of demands that would give us resources to organize ourselves independently of the state i think the the end point of, of, of the demand is a demand on ourselves. It's a demand on ourselves to collectively organize ourselves in a different kind of way, independent of the state, um, and to think about how to organize production and consumption in, in a more uh, sharing, caring way. 
uh, so, so that's question about who you make the demands on is, 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 is very important. And I suspect that it will really vary from context to context. In local contexts, where there are local governments that you can make demands on, then some things may be possible. Where there are very strongly centralized state apparatuses in the, the main economies of, of Western Europe, for example, and in the United States, it's very difficult to make a demand right up to the top of the state and expect the state to do anything sensible uh, in return. That's, that's one aspect of the answer that I would give. The other aspect of the answer is that it's the process of making the demands that is mobilizing people and is the most important thing. And that process draws people into a political frame where they think about the possibilities of change and come up against the, the, the state apparatus, which, which will do its level best to stop things from, from changing. And it's that process of mobilization, which is the other, the other aspect. It's not a side effect of the demands. For me, it's actually one of the main effects of the demands that, that we, we actually mobilize people, break, bring them out of their normally passive state and start to enable them to become active citizens working together to think about what should be done and then to pose their own demands. Thanks, Ian. And um, there's a next question connected to, directly connected to that. It is from Rifki. Um, in terms, I just read it. Should, should I, are you ready? Should I read it? Can you hear me, Ian? I can hear you. Okay, good. In terms of the demand for redistribution of time or in the more concrete form, the demand for redistribution of wealth, where exactly you think we should begin? Well, we can begin where we are. <laughs> If we're in a factory, Uh, working in a factory, then there are certain kinds of demands we can make for the redistribution of the production process, which can be very concrete. Uh, I think, of, for example, of the Lucas Aerospace um, collective plan from the 1970s, something that has started to be discussed again today, in which workers in the factory that were producing armaments Uh, got together through their trade unions to discuss how the production could be turned from making armaments to making socially useful goods, to making uh, kidney dialysis machines, for example. And they showed in detail how it would be possible to change that factory production from armaments production to, to goods that actually people needed uh, for their health and well-being. So that, that would be one domain in which you would make, make demands. Uh, another, another would be in the family, in each family unit or in co each collective living unit, the demand for the redistribution of time has to include who does the washing and the shopping and the cooking. You know, the, there you, you had the micropolitics at, at work. So I think the answer to the question is it depends where you are and you need to make different kinds of demands for this redistribution in a different way in each of your different domains of activity, the family and the factory and the community and so on and, and, and so forth. Yeah, thanks Ian. There are very many good uh, uh, questions coming in. I think the next are. one connected to demands. Hannah is uh, writing, I really like your idea with the demands, but in history, many sound demands have been capitalized, neoliberalized, taken up and integrated in the current system. Do you see a danger of that happening again? How can we work against that? Well, yes, uh, of course it can happen. It ha happens time and time again. We live under the, one of the most flexible um, innovative systems of production and consumption that has ever existed in history. The capitalist system is geared to making a profit out of anything, and it will engage in this process of 
recuperation, what the old situationists used to call recuperation, that is absorbing and neutralizing every progressive initiative and turning it into a means for profit. And we see some of the side effects of that, for example, in the ecological movement being uh, taken and used and harnessed by capitalism instead of being a threat to capitalism. I read the other day, for example, that in the supermarkets in Britain, which have been banning plastic bags, the supermarkets have been issuing what they call bags for life. That is very strong plastic bags that people can buy at a very high price. And then the idea is that they take these bags for life, these plastic bags, and they use them. But the problem is that the, the, the marketing of these bags for life is such that people are buying lots and lots of these bags for life. So there's actually more, more production of plastic bags than there was before. You know, we have just one example here of, of exactly this problem of the, of the recuperation of the demands as part of the logic of, of capitalism. And that requires very detailed analysis and sometimes sophisticated analysis of the way that capitalism is, is doing that. We have to be as sophisticated and innovative, more sophisticated and more innovative than capitalism is, because capitalism is very quick at rushing ahead and being ahead of the game. So it's, it's a question of our ingenuity in thinking about how to keep updating the demands and making them intelligible to people and pointing out how exactly those previous demands have been frustrated. It's, it's an absolutely essential question here, very good question that has to be part of our political thinking. Yeah, okay, then there's a, a comment, not a question from Gordana Jovanovic. Oh, hi. Uh, she, she, she's, she's wondering, is, is there sabotage at work because there are some technical issues uh, sometimes when you are talking? <laughs> So I also I also have uh, some technical issues. I, sometimes you are interrupted. So let's see. Maybe there's sabotage at work. But um, that was just a comment. But I think the, the the system works. I can hear you in general. Here it is. Here a question from Martin Dagen. In the current situation, aren't we mostly suffering from an interruption of exchange? What if capitalism is the most advanced developmental stage of this ex exchange that we all long for? Um, I'm sorry, I'm just puzzling about what that means. Uh, it's very intriguing, but um, while I'm puzzling about that, I'd, I'd just like to comment on Gordana's comment, yeah. uh, which is that we, uh, we do face sabotage all the time um, but I think we need to keep our eyes fixed on the way that the system itself is geared against us rather than worry too much about evil people who are manipulating things and trying to bewitch us and deceive us that is I, I think there's a especially dangerous trend at the moment and it's something that I did talk about in my paper for people who are frustrated about the conditions of the coronavirus turning to conspiracy theories um, in order to explain what is happening in which there are groups of evil people from outside doing things to us. Uh, I think we need to, to focus on the, the system-wide organization of, of the problem. Uh, coming back to Martin's question, um, I, I haven't got any further with thinking uh, 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 about it, but, but maybe, maybe one way into this would be to, to think about these conditions of exchange as conditions of relationships. They're the conditions under which relationships take place today uh, in this political economic system. And there are malign aspects of those exchange uh, phenomena um, in which people trade certain goods for other goods and then also trade certain emotions for other emotions. So it leads to a kind of uh, interpersonal manipulative 
uh, aspect to relationships in which people are suspicious of each other and trying to work out how to deal with each other. But there's a second aspect of this exchange mechanism, which is benign, which is where people are working out how to coordinate their action with each other and learn from each other and understand that the human being uh, is, as someone once said, an ensemble of social relations. It's not one island fixed on its own, but requires other people to, be, to, become, to become human. So uh, the interruption of relations that we're experiencing at the moment under the coronavirus is an interruption of relations of a very specific kind. And this is something that I really like about Slavoj Žižek's book, Pandemic, which I mentioned in my talk, where he makes the point that uh, the social distancing that we're engaging in doesn't necessarily only separate us from each other, but this social distancing requires us to engage in a kind of respect and an etiquette and, uh, and, uh, and acknowledgement of the needs of others. So it, it actually brings into play at a deeper, more profound level, um, the question of our responsibility to each other. Social distancing isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's a way of uh, understanding what the conditions are for being a human being at the moment in the world. I don't know whether that answers your question, Martin, uh, or, or whether you're asking something completely different. <laughs> yeah, th th that's a little bit too bad with, with this uh, online talk. You, you, the only question, to, you, that really a discussion possible. So that's yeah. too bad. Yeah. Um, I have, um, I take now two questions together because they are close. And, and um, from Brian Schiff and from Andrea Bernal. And it, it, it's about, Brian uh, is asking, how does demand become action? So, uh, and Andrea is uh, continuing, we may need change makers to make these happen. States are very disconnected of their realities. Social engagement should become a topic in college and high school. Well, uh, the question is how, how to enable people to become change makers themselves rather than to look for opinion leaders and other change leaders who will enact changes for us. I think we're facing a much deeper level now, the question of what is representative about representative democracy, uh, how it is we're able to operate on a local level that gives voice to many different kinds of people coming from different positions around gender and sexuality and race and, uh, and, and so on. And, and, and to, to, to bring together those, those contradictory perspectives and to um, link them in a way that uh, enables people to feel that they're actually part of the process of, of change themselves. So um, I, I would say that the, the action aspect of the demand will depend on context to context. That some for some people, it's enough, their action is enough to write a letter to a member of parliament. Now that's not the kind of action that I usually engage in. It, it, for me, it seems to me to be a waste of time, but I'm happy to sign a petition and circulate it and enable other people to participate in a way that they may feel comfortable to sign a petition and maybe encourage them to write to their member of parliament, to write to their representative. But lots of other kinds of action have to be opened up as well, which may include demonstrations, may include occupations, may include um, the shutting down of certain factories, maybe in the case of Italy a few weeks ago, for example, where industrial production around the Milan area was kept going by the large businesses at the same time that people were being urged to self-isolate, the, the trade unions got together and called a strike. You know, it was a strike in quite different circumstances with quite 
different effects where people were being asked to stay at home and to show their support for the strike in that kind of way. So the link with action, yes, is really important, but there are lots and lots of different kinds of links for different people that we need to enable for, uh, for this process of change to happen. Okay, there's a question which directly relates to what you said. Could you make a reference Oh, and I always don't say, oh, they are so, they enjoy your talk. Everybody think is, uh, you know, they think your talk is very, was very good. And I don't say that all the time. But I'm sure they didn't all think it was good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but many are writing that. Could you make a reference to trade unions' responses amidst the crisis? Yes. Well, that, you know, the example I just gave was, was, uh, was the trade union response. And the example that I gave earlier about the, the, the uh, challenging of the production priorities of the companies so that workers themselves start to participate in the decisions about what is made in the factories are trade union matters. A lot of the uh, industrial action that is happening today in the precarious workers sector that is the, the service sector um, and in the care sector, um, is not organized through the traditional trade unions. So we need, we need new forms of organization, new trade unions, and those new trade unions are being formed. New networks are being formed. And some of them don't call themselves trade unions, but oh, I don't care. <laughs> They're operating as trade unions. They're operating as collective bodies for the workforce to coordinate action and to think about what is good for the workers in such a way that is then able to open up uh, negotiations with the employers or with the state apparatus um, and to link with other groups of workers as well, which is absolutely crucial part of the equation. So trade unions, yes, are really important, but we need to think about the variety of different organizations that are emerging that actually function as trade unions today. Um, okay. Um, is it possible that I, time is running, is it possible that I take two questions together, in, or should I go one after the other? I, I know you're the boss, go on, you do, what do you think? Okay. I, I take two questions which are in a certain way I see connected. Um, one is from Likorakos Karatafiris, Uh, it seems like in this postmodern liquid area, many terms that, such as personal responsibility have been totally distorted to a point where one can only focus on persons rather than groups. Uh, I mean, losing the broader view of life's interconnections has been a big, a big success for capitalism. Uh, one can be diagnosed paranoid without any one reflecting on of how the world turns paranoid. So that's one question. And then the next one from Brian Schiff, please talk about conspiracy theories. Why do conspiracy, conspiracies, cons, conspiracies thrive in this environment and paranoid suspicious, suspicion? Yeah, okay. I mean, the, the, the first point is, is one that I, that I do agree with. And, uh, you know, it connects back to the, the issue of recuperation and the ability of capitalism to keep adapting itself, uh, transforming itself to, 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 cope, to cope with the demands that are made of it so that the demands don't threaten it, but actually end up reinforcing capitalism making use of people's ingenuity and creativity in order to uh, 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 buttress capitalism rather than uh, undermine it. The, the second question about uh, conspiracy theories um, is linked to paranoia, yes, um, is, is in, the, in the current conditions that we, of politics that we have at the moment, there is a, um, and this is, we haven't talked yet about the question of psychology, Okay, but here's an example of where the question of psychology and psychologization in the way that Jan de Vos uh, describes it in his different books and articles comes into play. Because psych 
politicization is not only manifested through the apparatus of the state dividing us from each other through measuring intelligence and personality and developmental pathways and all of that kind of thing, but psychologization also operates in our everyday lives by encouraging us to think not about social structures, but to think about our own feelings and to imagine that if we think about our feelings and dwell on our feelings and our emotional responses, then that is the source of the problem and that is the source of change. So this psychologization is extremely important. Now, the two aspects, the state aspect of psychologization and the interior personal aspect of psychologization are linked because the state is very adept at monitoring people's feelings and judging how they speak. And people feel judged. People feel that they're unable to express what they, what they feel, that they will be judged as being racist or sexist or homophobic or transphobic or, anti, or, or climate change deniers or something of that kind. It's a real problem uh, of psychologization here that people feel that they're not able to speak. And so when someone like Donald Trump comes along and says all of these horrible, ridiculous things, people are attracted to people like Donald Trump because it seems to them that he is saying what they're thinking and he is saying what they're not allowed to say. So we have to think very, very carefully about how we can, how we build forums for debate among the left and in the liberation movements in such a way as to not shut down debate too quickly and to reinforce, not to re reinforce the idea that people aren't allowed to speak. Because if you make people feel that they're not allowed to speak, then it will lead to these kind of paranoid conspiracy theories and lead to the rise of these paranoid conspiracy politicians, Trump, Bolsonaro, Netanyahu, Orban, Boris Johnson, there are endless around the world. This is the phenomena that we're, we're faced with today. It's a new kind of right wing, um, right wing operation globally appearing at a national level in different countries uh, uh, around the world, but it's fed by a peculiar kind of operation of psychology here. And I mean psychology not in a good sense, but psychology in a really, really toxic sense. Thanks, Ian. We have two minutes left and uh, we take two more questions. <laughs> uh, what, and I, I take both together. Uh, Alex Fabricius, what role does digital activism play in achieving your demands? And what types of digital activism do you feel would be the best effective and why? So, and then Gordana uh, Jovanovic. Gordana. Do you mean it is possible to expropriate functions of the state without expropriating means of production? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll just answer Gordana's question first, which is no. I do not. <laughs> uh, I think it is possible to make particular kinds of demands on the state and use the resources of elements of the state to, to turn elements of the state against itself in order to disrupt the most, um, the most harmful operations of the state, to, to, to win over elements of the state apparatus to us. That's always been the case go back to traditional Marxist approaches, back to the Russian Revolution in October 1917, and you'll see that part of the aim of the Bolsheviks was to break the state, not to completely oppose it and overthrow it, but to break the state, to win over the soldiers and, and, and state elements of the state apparatus to the side of the workers. It's a very classic Marxist uh, 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 argument that I'm making here. Nothing new or fancy or liberal or Eurocommunist, okay? Uh, coming to Alex's question on digital activism. Well, this is one, you know, these kind of Zoom seminars 
that we and Zoom meetings that we're involved in and um, and 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 Facebook sharing of memes and all of that kind of thing is is a kind of digital activism. Okay, it's it's not very much, um, but a lot of people who are have a point of connection with each other through social media and only have that point of connection with each other through social media. That's the place where we should be involved in those those debates and those those arguments because that's how we're going to mobilize people if they have nowhere else where they're having those debates together it's, it's absolutely crucial that's why this conference is such a great initiative really brilliant initiative thank you ian thanks for your talk and thanks for the discussion I would also like to thank the participants of uh, this session and uh, for all your wonderful questions. We couldn't go through all your questions and I think we will put it on this Slack platform and um, let's see what then will happen. Um, after the session, the day is not, the conference will go on. <laughs> so now will be a panel uh, directly, it's already, I think, started. It's about a panel about conditions, finiteness, and power. And I guess it will, some of the themes we had here will continue. And then there's another talk later in the evening. Thank you, Ian. Uh, and thanks for everybody uh, to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Ciao. Thank you.